knows my name. He knows my name. He knows my name. And oh, 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 how he walks with me. And oh, Lord, oh, oh, how he talks with me. And oh, how he tells, oh, how he tells me. I am his own, that I am his own. He knows, he knows my, Jesus knows my name, yes, he knows my name. And I'm glad about it. He knows my, my name, my name. And he knows my name. And oh, 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 how he walks. The preacher introduces you to Jesus and he lets you know that sometimes he'll talk with you. And, and oh, 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 how he tells me, tells me that I am his own. Sometimes I get weary, but you hold my hand. And I'm comforted, you hold my hand. We've got a loving God and Savior, and you will hold my hand. Like a good father, you hold my hand. And oh, how you walk with me. And oh, how you, uh-huh. And oh, it still, it still amazes me that you are my friend, that you are my friend. He knows, he knows my name. He knows, he knows, he knows my I think of Dr. Lawson as my father, but he had a father that knew, and he, God knew his name and his struggles. I'm glad, I'm glad that you know my, and oh, 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 how you walk with me, I'm glad I'm not alone, and oh, how you talk with me. And oh, he tells me, I am, I am his own. You know, you know, you know, you know, you know my, 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 my name. You know all about me, Lord, you know my my uprising, my downfalls, Lord, you, you know my, my heartaches, my headaches, my, my victories, Lord, you, you know mine, and I'm glad, I'm glad through it all, you walked with me, yes, you did, and oh, oh, how, how you talk with me, and I'm glad he let him know how, how you tell me, yeah, I am, that I am, oh, how you walk with me, I know how you walk with me. God wouldn't leave you alone, oh, oh, how, Newark. Church, oh God still tells you how you belong, you belong, you belong to me, and I'm your
Well, good evening, everyone. This is Wednesday night, the last night of our series from noon to three, seven saints on the cross. I'm Brother James Michael Crusoe, and, and, and I serve the Arlington Road Church of Christ in Hopewell, Virginia, 2106 Arlington Road. We got our start in 1947, September 1947. There was a tent meeting held in the city of Hopewell, right across the street from a Baptist church. Um, Two-week tent meeting, I believe, or a month long. I got to go back and search those records, but... Uh, Raymond Dunwood led the singing and John R. Varner uh, did the preaching and a Baptist preacher was converted. Uh, his wife first was converted in the heart, convinced her husband to come over and listen to that Church of Christ preacher. And uh, he did. He obeyed the gospel, came back and told his congregation, all who want to go to heaven, follow me. And over 147 people followed him and that's how the church of christ among black americans started in the city of hopewell so it's a great privilege for me to serve that church uh my second tour and a great group of people appreciate their support before i introduce our first speaker tonight i, I want to ask those of you who are watching on social media maybe facebook or maybe youtube because we're on three platforms tonight we're on Somebody Must Come Preaching uh, Facebook page, and we're also on our church Facebook page, Arlington Road Church of Christ, and then we're on Arlington Road YouTube. If you're watching on either of those social media platforms, uh, help us out by liking and sharing and uh, commenting. We, we want to know uh, where you're from what city, what state, what congregation you're from. Uh, if you do that, it, it'll make this, this broadcast uh, more spectacular than what I already anticipate. We've got two gospel preachers who, who are gonna share with us uh, two of the uh, seven sayings that Jesus uttered on the cross. I know many of you are aware that this coming Sunday, uh, many around the world, We'll celebrate what some call Resurrection Sunday, some call it Easter. But we're looking at uh, what Jesus said on the cross before he rose from, from the grave. There were seven profound sayings that Jesus made. And we heard from great preachers on Monday night, three, three great preachers, Courtney Carruthers out of Chicago, Illinois, uh, Gerald Johnson out of Houston, Texas, and William Jones from Rochester, New York. And then last night, what, what a mighty word we heard from Brian C. Jones out of Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, Dr. Jefferson Carruthers, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. He, he really told us about that thief, that thief on the cross. And uh, tonight, we're going to hear from Brother Mark Rowe. Let me bring him on the screen. Brother Mark Rowe is the minister of the Ninth Street Church of Christ in Paducah, Kentucky. Uh, he and his wife have, have two children. Brother Rowe and I worked together, I think about a, over a year ago um, in Little Rock. He's a uh, graduate of the School of Religious Studies where Lloyd Harris is the president. And uh, Ro and I were, were fortunate. I was fortunate enough. Let me say it like that. I was fortunate enough to work with Brother Ro and hear him preach in uh, our December lectureship. I, I became impressed with him and uh, look forward to working with him again. So God has brought us together. And Brother Ro, we're glad to have you. And we look forward to uh, your message. So at this time, Brother Ro, uh, the floor is yours. God bless you, my brother, as you preach the word. Thank you, Brother Crusoe. I really appreciate this opportunity to come and be able to speak uh, God's word. Thank you for your vision. Thank you for the continued platform that you provide uh, for us all to be able to stay edified and learn more about God's word. Thank you for this privilege. Tonight, I have been given the assignment of Father, 
forgive them. Father, forgive them. Luke chapter 23, Luke chapter 23, verses 33 through 34 uh, will be the text that I will use for tonight. Luke chapter 23, verses 33 to, through 34. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals on the right hand and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. Father, forgive him. They arrested him falsely. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns. They put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. They mocked him. They call him, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him. They took the reed and beat him on the head. They gave him vinegar mingled with God, with God. But yet God, through the grace of Jesus Christ, said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. In Isaiah chapter 53, Verse number 12, Isaiah prophesied that this event would occur. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12, therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many, and interceded for transgressions. And we see that prophecy being fulfilled in Luke chapter 23, verse number 34, when Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Father, forgive them, expresses the greatest love someone who was the recipient of such great hatred and mistreatment. I think I need to say that again. Father, forgive them, expresses the greatest love towards someone who was the recipient of such great hatred and mistreatment. Father, forgive them, expresses grace for the guilty. Father, forgive them, expresses salvation for the sinner. Father, forgive them, expresses mercy for the merciless. Father, forgive them for their sins. They needed forgiveness toward their foolishness. See, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. See, y'all, they were ignorant, but they were not innocent. See, they were ignorant of what they were doing, but they were not innocent. See, the word ignorant means is not to recognize or know through lack of information or intelligence, not to understand. Jesus is saying, Father, forgive them. They don't under, they don't know, Lord, what they're doing there. So in this text, we can see that Jesus could be saying, Father, forgive Pilate, for he could have let me go. Father, forgive Herod. He is the one who sent me to the cross. Father, forgive the Roman soldier who cried out, surely this must be the son of God. Father, forgive those who sat around and watched an innocent man being tortured and killed. See, it's just not Father, forgive them. 
But thank you, Father, for forgiving Mark Rowe. Because Paul said to the church, to Titus, in Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 6, for we, thank God for forgiveness toward us, for we also were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another, but when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love toward mankind appeared, he saved us. Thank you, Father, not on the basis of thee which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing, a regeneration, by the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So not only, Father, thank you for forgiving them, but God, thank you also for forgiving me and forgiving all of those of us who once used to live in sin. See, the word forgive means to release. Jesus is asking for those who treated him so cruel. He is saying, Father, release them. As in releasing a prisoner or setting someone free from an act they carried on. It is a decision not to hold something against someone, but rather to liberate a person from the consequences of his action. Jesus is saying, Lord, please liberate these people. Father, release them. Or Father, do not hold this against them. So when the Bible was saying that Jesus said, Father, forgive them, it, it, it exemplifies Christ's completion of his mission on the cross. It represents Christ's completion of his mission on the cross. See, this is a mission of Jesus. Well, what's the mission? When he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. What's the mission? To open the door of divine forgiveness for all who would receive him. Isn't that good news? To open the door of divine forgiveness for all who would receive him. So when we see what they did back then, and we see Jesus saying, Father, forgive them out of the mistreatment, being spat upon, being beaten, being scored. He said, forgive them, for release them, Lord. And we see in this text that from the development of what Jesus said, the apostles continued Christ's mission. Because when the Lord's church was established in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, we see what Jesus meant. Because in Acts chapter 2, Peter preached the first gospel sermon. In Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 24, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourself know. But watch verse 23. This man, delivered over by predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hand of godless men and put him to death. Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. And now Peter comes along and say, you nailed him to a cross by the hand of godless men and put him to death. But verse 24 said, but God raised him up again. Thank you, Lord, for resurrection, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in his power. So we see in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, therefore, 
let all the house of Israel know for certain that God who has made both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, here he comes again, whom ye crucified. So the Bible says in verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostle, brethren, what shall we do? See, this is the purpose. This is the mission that Jesus is saying that I want you to forgive them, Father, because they didn't understand what they were doing. There was a time in all of our life when we were living in ignorance. We didn't completely understand the detriment we were doing to our souls, the detriment that we was doing to others, and we were operating in ignorance. But thank God that Jesus had a plan. Thank God that Jesus had a mission. And in that mission, he was preparing a time that when we were ready to get our lives correct with him, we had an avenue of being forgiven. So they asked the question, what shall we do? Peter answered that question in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter said, repent. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Watch this. For the forgiveness of your sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, we see what happened. And now we see the apostles carrying on the mission of Christ. What's that mission? Is to proclaim the gospel to those who have been walking and living against the will of God. Jesus provided an avenue by asking, Father, forgive them. We see also, not only did the apostles continue the mission, but the apostles were committed to that mission. Amen, y'all. They were committed to that mission, because as they were proclaiming Christ, as they were proclaiming the gospel, they gave there was an honor given to them that we don't want you to teach in this name anymore. But in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, Peter and the apostles answered them, We must obey God rather than man. And then they they presented to them in verse 30 and 31, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus. What's the language? Whom you put to death by the hanging on the cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand and a prince and a savior. Watch this, to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. Do you see that message continuing? Not only do you see that message continuing, that in the heat of the moment, when they were threatened, the apostles were threatened, they stayed committed to the mission. They stayed committed to the call because mankind needed to hear the message of the divine cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. So what's what does this mean to us today? That means the church must continue the mission. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, for the love, that great love that was exemplified to mankind, the mistreatment, the abuse, the scourging, the mockery, all the things that was done to Christ. But he loved us so much that he even in the moment when we were not at our best, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Paul says it's that love. It's that love of Christ that constrains or controls me. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. When Paul says it's the love of Christ that's controlling me or constraining me, this should be 
the attitude. This should be the passion of every member of the Church of Christ. Amen, brothers and sisters. That word constraint, constraint or control mean it, it overwhelmed Paul. It dominated his life. It motivated him. It controlled his thought because Paul wanted to share that love that Christ showed him. He was determined to show that to others. It means to hold something together so that it does not fall apart, but it hangs together. Paul is saying this love that Christ had for me, it is exercising a constraining influence in my life. He says, I'm seized with it. He says, I'm affected with it. Not only am I affected with it, it is infecting me. And I can't help but to share Jesus Christ because that love, that love that was exemplified on the cross when he said, Father, forgive him. I think about the things I've done in my life and God set me free. It's that love that seized him, that love that controlled him. That's the same love that should be exemplified by the Lord's church on today. And then Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus and gave us, the church, the ministry of reconciliation. This world that we're living in today is divided. This world that we're living in today is leaving God, the church, the church should share that mission that came from the cross. The apostles continued the mission and the church should do the same. And Paul said in verse number 20, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God was making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. See, church, just like the apostles, our mission, our passion, our desire is to share with others what we have received from Christ. We are to connect those, connect to those who are lost. We are to give them the message of Christ because we, like the apostles, are God's representative to speak to the world Christ's mission. Now, I want to park for a moment as we get ready to end. We are not just members of the Church of Christ. I have been in the Lord's Church all my life, have no desire to be anywhere else. I know there's one Lord. I know there's one faith. I know there's one mission. I know there's one baptism. Amen. That's the foundation. And that foundation is solid. That foundation is sure. But there is another part of being a member of the Lord's church. We are also members of the church of Christ who are motivated with the message of Christ. Amen. It's good to be a member of the Lord's church. But are we motivated to share the message of Christ? Because mankind need the gospel. So if I'm a member, but I'm not motivated, if I'm a member and I'm not motivated, then I'm praying today. I'm praying tonight that God's spirit will help you to become more motivated to share Christ with others. I believe sometimes we are just satisfied being a member, 
but a member that's a recipient of the grace and the mercy of God ought to be motivated to share Christ's mission to a lost and dying world. My brothers and sisters, Paul said something valuable in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 1. He says, we, and working together with him, with God, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. I'm a member of the Church of Christ, but I'm struggling in my motivation of the love that's been given to me. Paul said, and working together with him, we urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Somebody need to remind the church that you can receive grace in vain. And my encouragement to us tonight, when the Lord said, Father, forgive them, we should never forget that. That should be etched in, the, in, our, in our brain, in our memory, to never forget that because we are the recipients of that grace. And we must reciprocate that grace to a godless world we're living in. My encouragement to you tonight, we have received grace. Let's make sure that we don't lose this race. We cannot receive his grace without accepting his mission and his ministry. God has been good to us. We cannot reject nor, nor neglect the grace of God. May God bless you. May he keep you. And may we forever be thankful to be forgiven by God. Have a good rest of the night. God bless you. Oh, mighty word, brother, brother Roe. My, mighty word. I, I think you worked up a sweat sitting in the chair, didn't you? Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. yeah. And, and, as, as you were preaching, I, I thought about a number of things and uh, outstanding lesson, out, outstanding. Uh, you, you motivated me tonight, you know, and you reminded us uh, of our mission. And so I, I'm motivated to get back to that mission. But as you were preaching, I thought about that text out of John when they say, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Can any good thing come out of Paducah, Kentucky? And the answer is yes, yes, yes. There's a gospel preacher in Paducah, Kentucky, who does not mind saying the church of Christ. You know, my, my heart is just so happy when I hear gospel preachers uh, echo that, uh, the church of Christ. Uh, fantastic job, Brother Ro. Uh, and I, I see a number of, of Ninth Street members on tonight. And, and I know that they are super proud of their preacher uh, for your, your presentation tonight. God bless you, my brother. God bless. Thank you. Now I'm bringing on a good friend of mine. Um, we, we're from the same hometown, uh, Dayton, Dayton, Ohio. Um, uh, he went to Roosevelt High School. I went to Dunbar. <laughs> uh, Larry played football. I played basketball. I think Larry was a member of the Guard Avenue Church. Mm -hmm. uh, he lived under Brother Roosevelt Chapman. Uh, and I was uh, at Collegiate Heights and then Springfield mm -hmm. under uh, Brother Ivory James and then Brother Eugene Carter. And uh, little did we know, Larry, <laughs> that, that 
we end up gospel preachers, you know. No, uh, in. Yeah, coming out of Dayton, Ohio. And uh, uh, Larry's married, his, he and his wife, Diane, have three children. And uh, Diane's parents, I, I, I know them well. Knew, uh, I know, know his, uh, her, her father, Brother Pope, and her mother, her mother passed, up, passed on. But when Sister Pope was alive, uh, she would invite me and Sister Crusoe over. She she would make homemade ice cream. Oh, oh, the hospitality, the hospitality. And Brother Pope, uh, you know, he, he he's a talker. Oh, he can talk you. He can he, he can talk you. And uh, we just had good fellowship with Brother and Sister Pope. And uh, Larry's a, a a a good friend of mine. Just a, a solid guy, faithful preacher of the gospel, um, and, and I could I could share his educational background, but I think he he would probably be embarrassed. But he has his doctorate degree, but he's just a humble servant of the Lord. Uh, he preaches in Henderson, Tennessee, and I'm looking forward to what you're going to share tonight. So, Brother Ivory, uh, the floor is yours. God. Bless. I want to thank you, brother, for the invitation to be a part of this gospel effort. And it is uh, great. Um, you are definitely one of those who has lifted the uh, name of the church in, from, in Dayton, Ohio. And um, we're just grateful that God has blessed you and blessed you with a good wife and with uh, good children and thankful that you are still serving the Lord in a very mighty way. Uh, tonight, I am to share with you the thoughts from Into Thy Hands. Uh, my admission is, as I've gotten older, I don't extend quite or expend quite as much energy. Brother Mark did an outstanding job and he did take some of the stuff that I've gotten <laughs> written. And so uh, you'll hear a little bit of that uh, repeated. But I wanna begin with thinking about the song. Why did my savior come to earth and to the humble go? Why did he choose a lowly birth? Because he loved me so. And then, of course, he gave his precious life for me because he loved me so. And as we remember the things that Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, we are humbled, but we are also excited because he did what he did because he loved us. He told the disciples, greater love have no man than this, than that a man lay his life down for his friends. I want to begin the thought because Jesus had a tremendous amount of trust in God. He began his ministry, both in Matthew 4 and Luke 4, just after his baptism, the transition to Jesus' earthly ministry. By illustrating that his trust in God we must understand that life must never be about trusting in our own power and in our own strength. It is not about us, but it is about God. In the book of Luke chapter four, then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan and was led by the spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days, he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, 
command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. The challenge here is to understand that it's not that Jesus doesn't have the power to do what is in his best interest. Jesus was led into the wilderness for the purpose of being tested. His life was governed by his trust in the one who sent him. And therefore, if the serpent or if the devil desired Jesus to uh, take care of his own problem by his own power, if Jesus would have submitted to taking care of his own problem by his own power, then Jesus would not would not have set the example for us to learn how to trust in God. And so, 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 so Jesus began his ministry by trusting in God. Man shall not live by bread alone. I got a problem. I'm almost dying here. But by every word that proceeds out of God's mouth. So, so, so we understand that beyond a doubt, without beyond, we, we, we understand that God is to be trusted no matter what we are faced with in life. And rather than trying to su find solutions how to, as to how to make our lives better, we need to submit our lives into the hands of the almighty God. Now, the, the, uh, the thought certainly comes from the book of Luke, chapter 44, where it was now about, at Luke chapter 23 and verse 44, it was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until, until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining and the curtain in the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Now, I want you to note that Jesus, after knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of your uh, sour wine was sitting there and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up the spirit. That's in the book of John chapter 19, 28 and following. But I want you to note, the idea of it being finished is that God through Christ and through Christ's death has completed his mission. Jesus came into the world and John saw him in the gospel of John chapter one and 29. And he said, behold, cometh the lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the whole world. And upon that cross, our debt to sin as humanity was paid in full. In the book of Colossians chapter 2 and beginning in verse 13, it says, And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. In short, the sin debt was paid in full. Here is Jesus spends his last moments of life. He spends them on a cross. He expresses that 
he, despite his life situation, is trusting in God the Father. He is setting the example for all of humanity. While the work on the cross is finished, Jesus must be in the earth for three days and three nights. This is why he cries, I commend my spirit into thy hands. He is not giving up the ghost. Rather, he is entrusting his life to God to resurrect him on the third day. It is in this resurrection it is recorded. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Amen. Jesus gave the commission to those disciples, and we are part of that mission. Since he has all authority, all power, Jesus says it is now time not to go just to the Jews, but share this good news to the entire world, uh, and to the entire world. So, so, so the, the idea is not just limit it, but to all ethnicities. Jesus spent three years in ministry. He served God and not always under favorable conditions. He taught and multitudes would not let him rest. He healed the sick and the sick would not allow him to rest. He lived righteously before God and the religious leaders would not allow him to rest. And yet he called unto people and said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly at heart, and you'll find rest to your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So when we have come to know Jesus, we trust in him. He will provide rest. Jesus is at peace with his relationship with his father. Therefore, as we trust in Christ, we should be at peace and find rest as we yoke together with him. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Just before Jesus shouts and breathes his last breath, for three hours the sun was not shining and the curtain separating the holy of holies was torn in two. Some have called the darkness a solar eclipse. However, the concept of a solar eclipse does not withstand the test. The darkness was three hours in length. An eclipse lasts about eight minutes. God has utilized darkness on occasions in scripture. In Exodus 10, 21 and 23, the Bible says, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, darkness which may even be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone arise from his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. God orchestrated the darkness, as one of the 10 plagues against Egypt, and also in Exodus chapter 14 and verses 19 through 20. And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other so that the one did not come near the other all that night. God has orchestrated darkness before. So darkness often implies judgment. Darkness often implies separation. And that is from God. Jesus is bearing the sin of the entire world. 
and God does not look on him. Note, this darkness occurs during the brightness uh, in uh, day. The brightest time of the day, God has sent darkness. Jesus is in tremendous emotional pain. And at this point, he feels all alone, separate, separated from the one he is trusted and encouraged all to trust. He is separated from those in whom he called to be disciples. He is separated from those who sought him and followed him. Jesus is all alone and bearing the sins of the whole world, the past sins, the present sins, and the future sins of the world are all on Jesus, and he is all alone. So at this point of his death, Jesus said, and when uh, he, he cried out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last breath. Jesus died and he commits his life into the hand of his father. Jesus suffered at the hands of Judas. Judas betrayed him for 15 pieces of silver. Jesus suffered at the hands of religious leaders. They were jealous and wanted him off the scene. Jesus suffered at the hands of Pilate and the Roman government. Yet he was willing to go through what he went through because he believed and trusted in his father. In the garden, just before he was betrayed, he was with Peter, James, and John, and Jesus prayed, <clears throat> he knelt down and prayed saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared uh, to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like sweats of great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Jesus is in agony. So what does into your hands I commend my spirit mean? When Jesus says into your hands I commend my spirit, he is quoting Psalm 31 and verse number five. The verse he is quoting is often rendered as into your hand, I entrust my life. And indeed, that is really the sense of it. In death, Jesus is entrusting his life to God, his life, the breath of God. He's going to be in the grave for three days, but on the third day, God is going to raise him up out of death. So at the end of his life, dying on the cross, he continued to trust his father. His trust is in the fact that his father is going to raise him out of death. And after the resurrection, Jesus would charge his disciples to preach the word after the resurrection. Peter will preach on Pentecost Sunday and about 3,000 souls will be baptized into Christ Jesus. Jesus saw the big picture and as a result suffered in his sufferings, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We now have salvation. So into thy hands, I trust my life. Every single one of us who know that Jesus died on the cross for our sins ought to be willing to entrust our lives in his hand. And although he suffered in the beginning and he suffered at the end and he struggled throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus never stopped trusting in God. And the illustration for us, the great example for us, is that we never stop trusting in God. We all go through difficulties. We all struggle with issues in our lives, but we cannot depend on our power to come through. 
we must depend on God's power to bring us out. In conclusion, Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and in verse 20, he says, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Notice, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. I want you to know that we have a ministry based upon the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ because of the cross of Christ to tell the dying world that Jesus is able to save. Trust him, walk by faith. Let him lead your life. Into thy hands I entrust my life. To God be the glory. Well, 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 we, 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 we heard a word from Henderson, Tennessee tonight. Uh, thank, thank you, Brother Larry Ivory. Uh, we got to trust him. We got to trust God. Amen. One of the things, brothers, that, that I uh, noticed beginning Monday and along with tonight, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, um, each, of, each speaker had one of the seven sayings. But the commonality, uh, you know, you guys did not get together and and, and uh, collaborate on, on your sermon. But one thing kept coming out uh, from each speaker, each speaker each night, the motivation to share the gospel with others. You know, everybody said that uh, in a different way. And, and so I'm blessed. I'm 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 motivated tonight to do even more when it comes to saving souls, personal work, and sharing the story uh, of the cross. Let, let me ask before we close, um, Brother Roe, you, you were first up. Is there anything that you uh, didn't get a chance to say that you want to share with us tonight uh, before we close out? Let me unmute you. Hold on. All right. You, you're unmuted. Okay. No, sir. I would just like to thank you for this opportunity. Uh, thank Brother Ivory for his lesson. And uh, may God continue to bless us all. And we all be motivated uh, to share his mission through ministry. God bless yeah. you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Brother Larry, um, anything that you would like to share that you didn't get a chance to share uh, with us on tonight? I'm just that I'm convicted. Yeah. I believe that uh, the the, uh, the Great Commission is not limited uh, to going overseas. Yeah. Uh, not even limited to just going uh, to do interstate missions. It is to be carried out every single day. Yeah. So when he said uh, uh, make disciples, he meant make disciples. Yeah. So rubbing shoulders with people and somehow working in the community as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I believe in I believe in mission work all the way around. But the mission is to tell people about the resurrected Savior. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and 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 you preachers reminded us of that. You know, every night that that was it wasn't drilled into us, but it was instilled in us to share that mission. And, and I would think, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I would think that one could take any one of those seven sayings and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, any one of those seven sayings could be a launching pad or uh, a beginning point to share the gospel story. But, 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 but I, any thoughts on that? Yeah. 
<laughs> Absolutely. I totally agree with you. Yeah. You could take either one of those and 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 teach the gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, you know, <clears throat> I was looking for approaches, you know, effective approaches to save the lost. And, and I think, Brother Roe, you mentioned, you know, you you you've always been in the Church of Christ, and you're one Lord, one faith, one baptism. You know, and that's why I got happy. I got y'all y'all couldn't see it on the screen, but I was like, oh, oh, I was up here, oh glory, glory, hallelujah. That's an approach, and uh, but also the gospel is is about the death, burial, and resurrection, the love that God had for us to save us, and then Father, forgive them. You know, who mm -hmm. who in this world doesn't need forgiveness? Yeah. You know, uh, all of us need forgiveness for something. Into thy hands I com commend my spirit, trusting Jesus or trusting mm -hmm. God, you know? So so I, I want to encourage those who are watching um, as we try to grow our congregation, you know, in Kentucky, in Tennessee, in Virginia, that any one of those seven sayings could be a conversational piece or a launching pad. Uh, and you don't have to, uh, you know, we're still one church. <laughs> we're not going to stop. We're not stop, stop being one church. But if those seven sayings don't convict the heart of a person, I, I don't know what other message we have and everything. Okay. All right. right. All right. Well, brothers, I, I'm indebted to you. Appreciate you. Love you guys, man. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, somebody asked me why why do I do this? These seven sayings. This is probably the third or fourth year. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I, I I was doing this before relocating back back to Virginia, and uh, it probably it, it comes from the aspect that uh, my last schoolwork was at a Baptist university, and my Baptist classmates we're doing things on the seven sayings on the cross. And, and I'm biased, y'all. I, I just, I believe in the one church and I believe that preachers, gospel preachers in church of Christ are second to none. You know, I'm not talking about your presentation or your style or your delivery. I, I, you know, I'm talking about the content. And if you are a preacher in the church of Christ, then your message needs to be heard. So that's where the, these seven sayings came came from. Um, that I just think that others need to hear gospel preachers in churches of Christ. You know, we don't need to be kept a secret. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that members from afar and of course the members in Hopewell, that you'll share these messages with your friends who are not members of the body, who are not members of the church of Christ, you know, uh, let's use social media in a positive way and let's get the message out. Amen. So for Arlington Road, uh, you've heard the seven sayings from the cross this coming Sunday. Uh, the sermon is from noon to three, which is the which is the thief. But I have helped me tremendously talking about the eclipse and the darkness because that's my sermon. That's my sermon topic this coming Sunday from noon to three. You know what, what happened in those three hours? So God bless you, Brother Roe. God bless you, Brother Ivory. Thank Appreciate you, brother. you all. And uh, we're going to say good night to everyone. God bless. Good night. God good bless night. you. All right. all right. And we didn't have any technical difficulties. Oh, man, the last, the last, the last two nights we had te technical difficulties. And I, and I was on pins and needles tonight <laughs> just praying that, that nothing, <laughs> nothing bad would happen. So God bless us on tonight. All right. Y'all take care, man. All, All right, right. Brother. okay.